things that we cannot bring. So they are really value-adding with the robot. So, our goal at Aldeba Robotics is to develop robots for development and well-being of humankind. Uh, it looks like arrogant, pretentious, but we've already seen that it's possible. And there are many, many other applications. And this is disruptive technology. You know what disruptive technology is, technology that will change the world. We've passed through many technologies in the past. For, for example, the first one was the fire. Before discovering fire, they eat us. But after that, well, <laughs> it's the opposite way around. So this is a disruptive technology. We've passed through the same with robots. You know, look at this one. We had soldiers going into caves to discover whether someone was hidden there, and sometimes they just discovered bombs. So after that, we, we didn't, we, we, uh, we don't have any more to send postcards to the family. So we have disruptive technologies that are changing the world. And it's the same with the companion robots. Uh, in 2003, we've had in Europe, uh, as you can uh, discover with my awful French accent, I'm from Europe. So uh, we've had in Europe a heat wave and 70,000 people died, all people died. They were alone, nobody was uh, watching them, uh, asking them to drink more and so on and so forth. 17,000 people uh, died uh, during that. I hope that in a few years, with the assistance robots, situation won't be the same at all. So we have possibility with robots to have disruptive technologies. That's what we are all fighting for. And the main driver behind robotics, well, there are several drivers, but the main one is demography. This is a population pyramid of Japan, uh, uh, above right part of the, of the slide. So what we can see, by 2015, 30 million fewer Japanese than today. 30 million, because it's one of the country, first country uh, which population is uh, decreasing uh, because of, uh, well, natality rate. 40% of Japanese population over 65 years old and workforce decreased by 11 million. So the question for Japanese people is not to have robots to develop robots as a showcase of the technology. No, not at all. It's mandatory for them. They have to find a way. And I brought this slide from a Japanese uh, researcher, head of uh, Tokyo University, and after that with a smile he presented the, the other part of the slide down, where all the countries in black are more or less in the same situation. So it's not only Japan, Korea, Europe, China, and in a, no, not in the same situation in the United States, but uh, the situation is more or less that, well, we need robots. But there are many other uses of the robot. It's not only a question of, uh, of uh, elderly people. Uh, supervision, gaming, uh, entertainment, entertainment, education, uh, uh, watching for, for plants, uh, factory plants, or watching for uh, power plants. So there are many, many situations where robots can use. Well, can be useful. We know what's happening in Japan, so we know that if we have robots uh, able to act or to, to just uh, have a look inside what's happening inside the nuclear uh, plants where it will degrade. So we, we know all this situation. So the reality is we'll have millions of robots in our societies in the next 5-10 years. Uh, we'll have millions of jobs behind that, either uh, for developing the robot, for software, for uh, services around the robot. So it's just something that is happening now. And the question is, we need to train new generation for doing that. So if we want, well, I'm older than the majority of you, so if I want to have robots helping me in the next 20 years, I need to have people handling these robots and developing them and improving them. So we need to train people. So education is key uh, if we want to have these useful robots in the future. So there will be robots everywhere. I'm not the only one to say that. There are many companies developing robots. Uh, here you have robots from everywhere around the world. I just have chosen some humanoid robots, companion robots. But the reality, even if there are many robots, there are no robots. You cannot buy robots. The only one you can buy uh, nowadays, now, is the only one. The others are just either uh, research products, very, very expensive. There is one from uh, Honda, Azimo, 1 million USD. Uh, well, it's for research. And there are 10 around the world, but you cannot use them. 
On the opposite way, uh, left hand side, you have entertainment robots. They are cute, they are nice, you can play with them, but they cannot interact with you. They are not useful robots. So in the middle, you just have one or two. You have the Taro. You had previously Ivo from Sony as an experimental platform. So now we have the same with Nao, and it's the only one that is affordable. Why? Well, because it's absolutely uh, very, very difficult. It's very, very complex. A robot is very complex technology. You have 100 technologies inside the robot. You have motors, you have electronic, you have um, gears, mechanical parts, but you have uh, software, you have system, you have voice recognition. The robot has to be able to to uh, recognize faces, has to be able to interact with you, to interact with other robots. There are many, many technologies, so many technologies so that it's very, very difficult to do. So there is a way uh, chosen by Honda. This is about the Honda project, uh, as you know. Uh, but they began in 1986. We are in 2011. You still have this, this robot uh, worth 1 million USD. Uh, there are 10 around the world. And it's a great one, able to run, to jump, and to do things. But, well, you need to have engineers preparing the terrain before. Uh, I've been told by David, the uh, director of this uh, museum, that uh, a few years ago, five years ago, four years ago, they had an Asimo coming here. But it was not possible to make it working, because you, you had to have a, a so flat floor, you need to have a three or four engineers around it, so it's not possible. You, can, you just cannot have it. But it's a way. And Honda is investing year after year, millions, hundreds of millions of USD uh, to, to improve this robot. And one day, they will have a correct robot that will be able to, 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 to handle and to help people. We have chosen another way. Our strategy is going for this personal assistant companion and useful robots to focus on only certain paths. So we focus on some ways and we are relying on, on communities. There are communities of, of researchers, there are communities of students, there are communities of programmers that want to, to be part of this adventure. Fortunately for us, we are in the world 2.0, so there are many people willing to be part of activities, of these uh, uh, challenges, and, uh, and developing an artificial companion. It's a, it's a phantasma coming from centuries ago. So there are many people interested in that. So our choice at Aldebaran has been to develop a now robot, so the, the robot that is over there and that you've seen in the video, a now robot that is a good robot. Not perfect, but it's a good robot uh, everywhere, so that the guy who is expert in AI intelligence, artificial intelligence, can use the functions of the robot and improve in just the part where he's the expert. And the other one expert in communication can do the same with communication. And the other one expert in motion, and so on and so forth. So our ID has been to provide a platform that is good enough everywhere to provide that at an affordable price, a robust platform that you can put in the hand of each and every student. They won't break the robot because it's robust enough. So you have the possibility to have people experimenting. And when you are experimenting with the robot, it gives you ideas, it gives you a way to improve it and to be part of this new adventure. So here I just put some of the idea. The goal is to have a, B, uh, a platform that works B plus everywhere. try making their stay uh, much, much more uh, fun, but at the same time creating a link. Because through the robot you are able to, you are able to take the control of your robot uh, through your mobile phone and to create a link, contact with your child, robot speaking with your voice and you have the, the visual feedback. Here are other people trying to make the robot uh, drawing, writing, grasping things.
something that is great with researchers in this field is they are really working, they are doing science here, but it looks like they are just playing. So they are able to have fun uh, performing their own duty, and that's great. Some research indicates that children with autism respond to people differently than they respond to technology, like computers and robots. The way that we interact with each other is, is very involved. We have gestures and facial expressions and, and, and body movements and tone of voice, all of these things, all at once. That can be really intimidating for a child with autism. So what can a robot do that a person can't? We're trying to break down these behaviors, to simplify these behaviors, have the robot do a couple of these behaviors at a time. What we have here is the PR2 and a group of nouns playing the traditional Japanese game, Naruto-san-Bakurona, which is quite similar to the beloved American game, Red Light, Green Light. In this demo, the PR2 is showing it doesn't have a mic. Motion timing is controlled by command input by a human. The red mouse on the base of the PR2 is set to automatically respond to the human's voice by knocking on the <laughs> Thank you. 